This is episode 37 of Stand Up. Hello, my amazing, beautiful, brilliant, curious, passionate, outraged friends. This is episode 37. We're talking impeachment with Ellie Mistal. Racism with Dr. Ibram X. Kennedy. Nuclear energy with John Donvan. And our entire generation of teenager phone zombies with my wife, Valerie. This is Stand Up. Let's get it going. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here on Stand Up, where each and every episode we try to learn from our guests. We try to fight apathy. It's a classroom where we learn together from our expert guests and other interesting people about the issue and ideas that matter to you, your family, your community, country, planet, your own personal well-being. And today we've got four different ideas and issues and four different guests. Oh, it's a big one. Big episode here on Stand Up, episode 37. Thank you for listening. If you haven't given the show a rating, today is the day. You can easily help grow the show by doing just that. And thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. This show is advertisement-free. We've just surpassed 300 awesome people who are the sponsors of this podcast. And I'm brewing up some exciting ideas that will be exclusive to those of you with a paid Patreon subscription. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you for supporting me on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Flash Pete Dominic is a great app, company to support your favorite artists, journalists, commentators, comedians. So thank you. All right, let's get to my first of four guests. You've seen him on MSNBC a lot. He is now a justice correspondent at The Nation magazine. Called him up, got him on the phone eh, around 8 o'clock on... Tuesday night where there was still a lot to go in impeachment. I'm posting this hopefully by midnight. There's so much relevant stuff. I want to get it out there. So you may know more. We may know more about impeachment, but Ellie Mistal is always awesome. Then stay tuned for Dr. Ibram Kendi talking about his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. John Donvin is the moderator of Intelligence Square Debates. This week they have a debate on nuclear energy where the motion is, it's time to expand nuclear power. And lastly, I invited my wife down. Everybody loved my wife last time in the studio to talk about teenagers and their soul-destroying relationships with their mobile devices, including our own. All right, let's hit it. Ali Mistal, he's up first. All right, he's one of the most brilliant, articulate, passionate, and I think hilarious and almost always right. What do I know if he's wrong? People in all of politics, certainly legal issues. He is the justice correspondent at The Nation magazine. You've seen him on TV a million times. He's got a huge following on the Twitter where he is awesome. I check his Twitter every single day, all day, and that is at Ellie NYC. I'm addicted to it. He's the Elvis of impeachment. Ellie Mistal, was that insulting? I just wish I, I just wish that I could be using my talents for more happier times, you know? Well, I mean, you're a legal expert. I mean, it's always going to be dramatic stuff, I suppose. Yeah, but we could be, like, fighting to, like, free kids in cages or fighting to, you know, um, extend, you know, voting rights uh, in, in the way that the 15th Amendment in- intended. And instead, we're fighting about whether or not the criminal president will be held accountable for his obvious crimes. I mean, it's... <laughs> Uh, all right. There's no. If this was a Law and Order episode, it would have been over in the first 15 minutes, right? <laughs> Lenny, Lenny would have been like, "Cuff him, Ed," and like that in a minute, right? Because he did it. <laughs> all right. So you wrote a piece that was posted uh, at the Nation magazine this morning, uh, titled "McConnell's impeachment plan is to make us all give up." The senators just released trial rules are designed to exhaust the public into losing focus and hope. Ellie, you posted that this morning. We've had a, what? What time did it start today? 1 p.m. It's still going. 1 p.m. Yep. And and, uh, and it's still happening so far. Is your prediction right? Yeah, I mean, look, this is this has been this is the plan. It, it is to extend this to the point where most people are not watching and not seeing all the damning evidence against Donald Trump. It's to close down witnesses. It's to close down document production. Um, and it's hoping that after a certain amount of time, all of these arguments start to sound like, you know, like I said in the piece, Charlie Brown's teacher just going wah, 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 wah. Um, and people like lose, lose the plot of what's actually going on here. What is the plot of what is actually going on here? OK, there are two. One, the president committed the crime that he is 
accused of. He, ab- he abused his power by trying to get a foreign government interested in the election by investigating his, his rivals, and he obstructed Congress by refusing to comply with, du- with duly made subpoenas or produce uh, witnesses in their investigation into his crimes. Those are two, those are the two things that he's been impeached for. Those are clearly impeachable offenses. Game, set, match. That is plot one. Plot two, he continues to obstruct Congress and their impeachment investigation into him by continuing, uh, by, by refusing to make available these key witnesses um, that saw what he did, right? And so the other thing that's happening here is Mitch McConnell's attempt to declare Trump the winner of this impeachment saga before the fact that Trump has lost this battle becomes evident and obvious to everyone. Something I've been saying, and you've seen me say this on Twitter, and I, and I and just every time I get the opportunity, I've been trying to bring this up because I don't feel like elected Democrats are doing that good of a job of saying it. <clears throat> we are already at 51% of the American people believe that Trump should be removed, and the trial hasn't started yet. 70% of Americans think that John Bolton at least should be subpoenaed to, test, to testify, and the trial hasn't started yet. So the, the public relations battle here has been is, is, is a loser for Donald Trump. McConnell wants to declare him the winner before the, the, the public becomes overwhelmingly against him. OK, so earlier I basically I, I, I dropped in and I tweeted that it seemed that the uh, the Republicans don't want to hear any of the evidence that could either exculpate. I use the big word, uh, the president or find him guilty. They don't want to see the documents. They don't want to see the evidence. It, it, I mean, it put, put this in layman's terms, if it were any kind of other criminal or civil trial, who wants to hide the evidence that would find their their client? What lawyers would want to hide this evidence? They don't want to see it. What am I missing? OK, well, two things. One, just the I, yes, I have legal training, but I come at this from the defense side. Right. Like you say, a lot of lawyers on TV, they're former prosecutors. They're all like, book them, Dano. Like those are like, <laughs> I'm on the other side. So I'm always uh, I think amenable or, or, or I have understanding for, for why defense teams plays, uh, play various tricks and do various things to try to keep certain kinds of evidence from the court, right? Like there, there are legitimate reasons. I don't subscribe to this, uh, to the notion that like, Oh, if you're innocent, you have nothing to hide. Just take the stand. No, that's not right. You should never take the stand in your own defense. Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> right. so I understand it from that perspective. But the but the the thing that makes the Trump defense kind of interesting and and uh, and I believe like makes it very obvious that Trump is in fact trying to hide something is that there are key people who could easily exculpate Donald Trump if they had anything positive to say. The person, as from what we have known from the other witness testimony and other reports, the person who put the hold on the money was acting White House Chief of, Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. So arguably, Mick Mulvaney knows why he put the hold on the money. And if he had any good reason for doing that, he would be you know, shouting it from the rooftops, I held the money because of corruption. I held the money because of this. I held the money because I wanted Europe to pay its fair share. He doesn't say that. Instead, he got up at a White House press conference and said, yeah, we do this all the time. Instead, he confessed to the very crime that Trump is being accused with, right? So that is why Mulvaney refuses to testify. And that is the, that is the issue where the defense strategy doesn't work. Because if you have a witness that you claim can exculpate you and then you don't make that witness available, well, then that is evidence of guilt, right? It's almost like me saying, well, you're accusing me of killing a person, but actually that person is alive and is my best friend. And so the court says, <laughs> okay, bring him forward. Oh, I can't find him. <laughs> Where'd he go? He's in the treehouse. 
He's Please. he's he's gone fishing. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're I, saying this guy can prove that you didn't kill him, but now he, now all of a sudden he's unavailable, sir. I think you might have a problem. I, he's doing community service hours, <laughs> and he's unavailable. He's very so. Uh, how about the Democrats in the House? Where did, where did they go wrong? If they went wrong, why didn't they have Mick Mulvaney or Pompeo or John Bolton testify? They didn't go wrong. They asked. They're like, come on down. They were like, no, we're not going to. And if you ask us to come, we're going to sue you. And we're going to hang up your entire operation, investigation, whatever, in the courts for as long as possible. So don't even try it. Now, I don't necessarily or at least didn't necessarily agree with the strategy that the House impeachment investigation had to be wrapped up by Christmas. There, I've, I, I understand politically why they wanted it that mm. way. Um, but I don't know that I agree. I agreed legally, you know, but, but that is, again, that's the lawyer in me. There's a reason why nobody's going to vote for my ass for Congress. Right. Because I'm like, what you want me to subpoena you? Okay. I can write that subpoena like on my, on my phone. No problem. Uh, um, but you know, the Democrats uh, in, in the house were looking at kind of political concerns. And I think, and here's where I think their strategy has really paid off or at least kind of, Here's where their strategy makes a lot of sense. The House understood itself to be conducting an investigation. A lot of times in an investigation, you talk to the people who want to talk to you and you don't talk to the people who give you a lot of gruff about like, you know, if, especially if you're if you're talking about the uh, about the target, if the target's own people won't show up to defend the target, you're like, okay, that's probably evidence that the target did something wrong. Right. Our investigation is going to go forward. Right. Like if you were, if, you know, if the cops are investigating me for, you know, a crime and my wife doesn't want to show up to like defend me, it's not like the cops are going to subpoena my wife. They're going to be like, all right, good luck with that. <laughs> it is in the trial stage. And that's what we, where we are now. The Senate impeachment trial stage. It is in the trial stage where witnesses should be compelled to testify, even if they don't otherwise want to. So and that is what the House Democrats are asking for now. Compel the testimony of a John Bolton or Mick Mulvaney or Mike Pompeo, because now we are conducting a trial. Can they compel them? Can they force those people that you just mentioned to show up and testify? Absolutely. Look, the, 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 the long and the short of the impeachment process and the reason why the Republicans have so much control over it is because the way impeachment works from a constitutional perspective is that the Senate can do whatever the Senate wants. It is it is in their sole discretion. It is set up that way. If you think about it as as a check and balance kind of thing, it would be ridiculous to give the executive branch any power at all over impeachment. If the issue is whether or not the executive, the head of the executive branch should be removed from office. So whereas when the House subpoenas, um, let's say, Bolton. Um, and and Bolton says, I'm going to ignore the subpoena. The only person with law enforcement capabilities to force him to show up would be the attorney general, the FBI and all of the kind of Justice Department apparatus. Right. That's in the executive branch at the Senate impeachment trial. The Senate is empowered to enforce its own subpoenas. Right. So if you notice uh, today, uh, they've been reading a lot of the amendments. Proposed, proposed by Schumer to compel these documents and these witnesses. And in the, in, in the Schumer amendments, it says very clearly, um, we want to subpoena Mick Mulvaney and we want to authorize the sergeant at arms of the House and his deputies to do whatever he has to do to compel that subpoena. That means once you take out the legalese, we want to subpoena Mick Mulvaney. If he doesn't show up, we want to send guys with guns over to his house to drag his ass oh. into the chamber. Oh, wow. Like straight up. Like that is what that amendment means if it could pass the Senate, which of course it can't because Mitch McConnell. So what happened today? There are all these different amendments proposed, and it was the number we're seeing all day is 5347. Our friend David Gura said he's going to go play those numbers uh, <laughs> because that's what we're going to see the rest of the night. Although it seems that the big question that everybody is focused on is will the uh, the moderate Republicans, those are in danger of losing their seats in the Senate, will they vote for the one amendment of witnesses? Uh, we haven't seen that yet. Are we going to see that tonight? And uh, this is going to be posted in the morning. So w w can you predict the future? Yeah, I mean, that's what they're debating right now as we speak. I imagine right now they're directly debating Mick Mulvaney. I bet that about uh, a couple hours they will get to debating uh, John Bolton. 
Um, what's going to happen, I believe, is it's going to be 53-47. McConnell has somehow used his magic powers to make Mitt Romney and Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski and Lamar Alexander, those are the four who allegedly wanted witnesses, um, and those are the four you need to go from 53-47 to 51-50. Um, uh, those, uh, uh, 5149, sorry. Um, those four apparently are satisfied with McConnell's rules. And McConnell's rules say that we're going to have the whole trial without witnesses and documents. And then only after the trial will we decide if we needed witnesses and documents wow. to make our decision. Um, as Adam Schiff called it, literally using these words today, it is ass backwards. But for reasons passing understanding, that's where Susan McCollins and Lamar Alexander and them are. And this is all crammed into three days, which makes it harder for the public to pay attention. You said also in your nation magazine, basically. Well, this is the, this is the exhaustion, right? Like I'm still here watching it. They're, if they want to go to one a, to one a.m., I'm going to be here at one a.m. Right? I ain't got shit else to do. But uh, sorry, that was. <laughs> How dare you? I, I don't have anything else to do. That's fine. Um, you can say anything you want here on the podcast. I love it. That's why I have you on. Be is uh, curse as much as you can. Uh, okay, so th- they're going to go on. Most like, people, most people have jobs, right? Like yeah. I, most people have to. Like and my wife is not going to be up here till one a.m. because like she has a real job in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> What's that like? Right, that's terrible for her, but like she's got to go. So that yeah. means, though, what that means—the reason why I bring that up, the reason why that's important—is because public perception uh, is it, it matters on this, and what we're not going to see. Because of that, because of the way that it's crammed in is so much of the evidence and arguments provided. And we're also not going to apparently see any witnesses being called. Is that going to be the deal? We're really never going to see them. We're, ne- we're never going to hear from the people who are in the middle of this extortion. If Mitch McConnell has his way, yes. If Mitch McConnell has his way and he can keep those four Republican senators in line, then yes, then we will get through this entire thing without hearing what what people like Bolton has to, have to say until Bolton publishes his book and without hearing what Mulvaney has to say until 10 years from now when Mulvaney wants to publish his book. And he's, you know, Mulvaney is going to come out one day and write like the OJ book. Like if I did it, here's how like, ah. that's going to be <laughs> what we got from Mick Mulvaney yeah. in 10 yeah. years. Like don't rest assured. So this um, is going to be over and done with in three days. Uh, it's going to be a week, right? Cause today and tomorrow debating the amendments and then it starts and then McConnell, like, last minute decided to extend it, extend it from 24 hours over two days to 24 hours over three days. And there's 16 hours where basically allows the senators to like make their speeches. Um, so it's probably, we're probably looking Saturday, Sunday. Um, it, but it'll, it'll certainly be wrapped up if McConnell has his way. I mean, it'll be wrapped up before the Super Bowl. And, right? and like, oh, that's important and interesting. And then the president uh, gets to say, say, uh, they vindicate him in the Senate, and uh, he comes out looking uh, smelling like roses. I see. I no, I don't think that. No, true. there like, will be damage done as a result of the hearing. What are you saying? Yeah, I, I I think this. I I don't see how this helped him. All of this is bad, and whether he escapes <laughs> with his tail between his legs or not. I mean, obviously, look, he's gonna if they acquit him, he's gonna get on Twitter totally exonerated, which like he's gonna do his his Trumpian thing, right? Yeah, like, yeah. we know that. But again, I look at the numbers, 51% for removal, 70% for, for, for Bolton testifying, and we haven't even started yet. Like, this, this is doing damage to him. It makes him look like a cover-up artist. I don't know that Democrats have the ability, kind of in the presidential election, to make him pay for this, you know, to, to, to make these numbers stick. But I think it is ridiculous to say that somehow going through all of this is good like, it's not, it's not good. People keep saying, oh, well, Clinton came out stronger um, after the impeachment than he was before. Al Gore didn't. Right? Like, <laughs> there, there are, uh, yes. there are uh, uh, penalties for, uh, uh, may, for being a historically uh, criminal president, and I think this is one of them. Ali Mistal, thank you for joining me on short notice. I love talking to you. You got to come on whenever I, you can squeeze in a few minutes. At Ellie, E L I E N Y C on Twitter. Follow him there. Read him at The Nation magazine. I know you're going to be up late, and uh, I'll be following you on Twitter as always. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Pete.
All right, Ali Mistal on impeachment. Lots more to come. Lots of great analysis from him and so many others that I hope to have on the show. Follow him on Twitter. Read him at The Nation, like I said. Now we get to guest number two, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He is a professor of history at American University. He is a speaker, a writer, and a very, very brilliant guy. Very soft-spoken, but extremely passionate and I think accurate about his work. His books are very good. I've learned so much from this very well-respected anti-racist. Do you know what that is? Anti-racism. He is the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University in D.C. He contributes to The Atlantic Magazine and CBS News. And he also wrote Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. And his third book that we talk about today is How to Be an Anti-Racist. And uh, very excited to have him on the podcast. We had a fantastic conversation, learned so much whenever I talked to him. Very soft-spoken, but very passionate, and I think very accurate, and I love talking to him. Here's my conversation with Ibram X. Kendi right now on Stand Up. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, for joining me to talk about your new book, your new work, and everything that you're doing. Appreciate your time today. Oh, it's great to be on the show. I got uh, great access to uh, really awesome guests at SiriusXM since launching the podcast. I was, I was, you know, making sure I wanted to reach out to some of my favorites. And one of my favorite conversations I had last year was with you shortly after your book was released, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And I wanted to just start by asking you, because I've been pre- preparing to talk to you again for, for hours and days How has it been? The book's been out for about a year, I feel like, and you've done what seems like hundreds and hundreds of interviews. How do you feel about the reception of the book to the public? I mean, I'm I'm pretty overwhelmed in the sense that I mean what I I wanted the book to help people to do is, you know, to really sort of look within themselves and, and look within our society in a, in a very critical and honest way. And, and I've been pleasantly surprised to, to see so many people doing that. Um, and it was very hard for me to, to do it in writing that book. Um, but I'm happy that it seems like it's sort of motivated people to do the same. I feel like books like yours have had a huge impact on me. Uh, I think uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow had a really big impact on me. But Can a book like yours have as much of an impact on the way that we think as a person's own personal experience and journey through life? I mean, that's the hope. I mean, and I think that's the beauty for me of books, that that it's very intimate and that, you know, it's just us with the book. And and it really allows us, you know, I think good books to to really be honest with ourselves and, and transform ourselves. Um, and, and, and I think there's been several books that have done that for me. Um, and so of course I was hoping this book could help, uh, people t- that this book could do the same for other people. What, what books uh, would you mention that have been so influential on you the way yours has been on me and so many others? I mean, obviously I think like many people of my parents' generation, the, the autobiography of, of Malcolm X has, has been critical and actually was critical even when I sort of started thinking about writing this book and, and even the willingness to talk about those most shameful moments of my life and be deeply self-critical and really to show my own evolution. I mean, that's precisely what, what Malcolm X did in, in his book, um, you know, being able to show his, his own evolution. Let's talk a little bit about that because uh, you bring it up. Uh, you you have uh, had to overcome some of your own, you say, uh, issues and bigotries and racism growing up. You talk about at the beginning of the book, this speech that you gave that won an award. You talk about wanting to change uh, the color of your eyes. Tell, share with us uh, any, any of those experiences and why you look at look back at it and how you look back at it. Well, I mean, yeah, the book opens with me sort of detailing and chronicling this MLK speech competition I was involved in as a as a senior in high school. And this was of course the this was the year 2000. And so I had came of age in the 1990s and if there was ever a decade in American history where black youth 
were considered the American problem, um, was certainly considered the racial problem. And, and black youth were constantly told that we didn't value education, that we were so violent, um, that, you know, hip hop was ruining our minds and, and ways. And, and ultimately I realized that I consumed and came to believe many of those ideas and, and ended up sort of expressing them in this speech in which I was as a black youngster saying all the things wrong uh, with black youth, as opposed to realizing all of the different ways in which racist policies and, and ideas are actually ensnaring black youth. You talk so much about racist policies in this book and you talk in your, uh, in your previous book, of course, about that as well, stamped from the beginning. And I, I, that's my favorite part of this conversation because it. It's so illuminating and and detailed when we talk about the actual policies that get us this place. And you go way back in history as well. Why do you choose to talk about it that way in terms of the racist policies? Well, I, I think that when we think of racist policies and their effects, um, their effects in terms of their they leading to these racial inequities. Um, and, and disparities and injustices. And even when we think of racist ideas, these are historical. Like racist ideas are deeply historical concepts and, and, and racist policies, the current ones that exist and even have historical roots. And so I thought, I think it's important for people in order to understand the racism that they're experiencing and even challenging um, today for, for them to understand their historical roots, because they literally all do have historical roots. And, and we've been challenging those policies over time. Some of those policies have been eliminated. Others have been rejuvenated and become more sophisticated over time. And, and, and it's critical for us to see how racism has transformed, even how it's progressed over time. And I try to share that in my work. I think you have to start with, obviously, as you do, uh, uh, you talk about the slave trade. You talk about when when race was first defined, which is a, probably one of the most fascinating parts about your book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. But you also obviously talk about educational opportunity and economic opportunity and the opportunity uh, to create a more equitable democracy. And we can unpack any one of those. But I wanted to start with just the idea, you, you say something that I don't think is provocative, but a lot of other people would, that to, to truly be anti-racist, you have to truly be anti-capitalist. Did I get it right? And what do you mean by that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm making both an historical and an empirical argument. And I think, you know, when we talk both about racism and capitalism, the, the arguments are, are deeply ideological, but I think we can also make an historical and, and an empirical argument. Empirically, when you look at the United States, you can't really separate whiteness from wealth, and you, you can't really separate blackness from poverty. In other words, black people are disproportionately, and Native people and, and Latinx people are disproportionately impoverished or, or members of the working class, while white people are disproportionately wealthier. And they have... 10 times more wealth. And so there's this interrelationship between race and, and class, um, racial inequality and economic inequality. And ironically, that's always existed since the dawn of racism in, in the 1400s. You've seen this relationship between policies and systems and structures and ideas that were both leading to economic and racial inequality. Where are we at today in 2020? I mean, you can go back to slavery and we always should and we should have reminders of that. Of course, we don't have these memorials and monuments in our country uh, nearly the way that we probably should. Uh, and I was just down in Charleston, South Carolina, and it was interesting to see all the buildings that had been, uh, been built there by slaves. And uh, someone pointed out to me that even the bricks were made by slaves and they're still there. And so it's 2020 and all of that history still matters. But where are we now with economic policy in the United States of America? It seems like capitalism certainly isn't patriotic and it definitely picks winners and losers. Well, I mean, I, I think that you, uh, you, you currently have a, a racial wealth gap that's growing. And, and so, as I mentioned earlier, white people have about 10 times 
more wealth, median wealth, than, than black people in this country. And one forecaster is estimating that by 2050, Three, black median wealth in this country is expected to redline at zero dollars. And so this racial wealth gap is growing. And then you also have black people who are nearly twice as likely to be unemployed. And they're more likely to be, as I mentioned earlier, impoverished. Their homes, even though they have equal stock as as, as homes in majority white neighborhoods, um, they're less likely to grow in value. So then the question becomes, why do we have these 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 gaps between middle income people, between working people, between poor people, and between uh, wealthy people? And and then you start looking at the policies in terms of, you know, whether it's the tax cut for the super wealthy who are predominantly white or whether you talk about the mass incarceration of of, of, of black and brown people in, in key um, sort of years in their life which really prevent them from, from building wealth um, or you're talking about our housing segregation and the way that that allows for the boosting of the value of, of white homes and under or depreciates black homes or even the, the inability of studies show of, of black people relative to, to white people with similar profiles to get loans. And so there are so many different policies or lack of protective policies that are leading to these inequities. This phrase that uh, I think uh, you and others have, have used, I think, is really important when we think about why people are in the situation that they're in. Uh, the phrase is, you have less because you are less. That doesn't have necessarily racial overtones. I mean, you look at people who are uh, living in, in poverty and it's so easy. And I think probably most people look at people who are poor, living in poverty and say, it's their fault if only they worked harder. And by the way, the opposite is true as well. Right. I mean, we probably even more we're even more likely to think that if you have a lot in terms of uh, financial success or wealth, it's because you worked hard to have less is because you are less to have more. It's because you are more. Help me unpack that, because I think it's the, the one of the greatest canards perpetrated on any society. Well, I mean, I think. The idea that you have more because you, you are more completely disregards the fact that most wealthy people in this country had their wealth inherited. And so, in other words, they didn't do anything but 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 cash checks from their from their fathers. You know, even the and mothers, even the president of the United States estimates show that he received upwards of four hundred million dollars from his fam from his father, even though he presents himself as this quote self made man. And that's indicative of you know other people who who don't want to acknowledge and admit the way in which their wealth is is derived from inheritance because of this larger myth of this sort of self-made woman and the self-made man and this idea that impoverished people or working people or even middle-income people are are still in, in that economic condition because of what they haven't done. But I also think that the greater problem is when we individualize groups. In other words, are there individuals out there who could have worked harder, who if they made different decisions, they would be in a different economic place? Right. Um, that's yes, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about groups of people, groups of people who have both people who make great decisions and not so great decisions. And so then the question is, when you have these, we have two different groups with many different and a diversity of sort of talent. Um, why is it that that one group is, is far and away more wealthier than the other when they're both equal? Um, that and the only answer to that is racist policies. I wanted to uh, ask you also uh, I, just about what happened this week. Uh, of course, it was Martin Luther King Day on on Monday and of this week. And you saw this major, I don't know if you call it protest or gathering at the Virginia State House. And it was all these, I mean, overwhelmingly, I didn't see any people of color. Doesn't mean they weren't there. But white men wearing masks and, uh, and, and strapped with um, assault weapons or whatever you want to call them, AR-15s. They had guns and ammo. It was, it was, it was crazy. And you've written about this uh, for The Atlantic Magazine. You've written about this in your books. I just have to know what you saw and how you reacted to uh, this protest in, in Virginia of these, quote, guns right people. 
rights people? Well, I think I think first and foremost, one of the most striking things that I recognized is, and I think other people have pointed, many people pointed this out on that day, was that a similar thing happened in in 1967 in California, in Sacramento, in which there was a proposed bill that would essentially have disarmed members of the Black Panther Party. And those members of the Black Panther Party essentially came to the Capitol to demonstrate um, against this proposed bill that was that was supported by the NRA. Um, and, you know, the Sacramento Bee, the local newspaper, had a banner headline that stated the Capitol invaded. <laughs> and so in contrast, you had, and I think there was a few dozen members of the Black Panther Party who, who, Im- who were involved in that demonstration. You contrast that with, with the other day when you had tens of thousands of white men who are armed and it was classified as a gun rights rally. <laughs> um, and that bill, of course, uh, in the Virginia um, legislature, of course, was opposed by the NRA. And so, you know, these striking sort of contradictions really sort of demonstrate to me the relationship between race um, and, 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 and gun rights. Well, the other one that, you know, a lot of people were pointing out was you don't have to go back to the 60s. But if you have a a Black Lives Matter protest or or any kind of protest or gathering where there are a lot of people of color, there certainly seems to be a huge uh, presence of law enforcement. And I wasn't there and maybe I'm missing it. But uh, a lot of people were pointing out that there wasn't uh, much of a law enforcement presence at this protest, even though all of these men had guns on them. Is that, was that your perspective as well? Are we missing something? Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's something that's so normal, um, you know, in the American <laughs> yeah. psyche. Yeah. And, and I think what's fascinating about this is precisely what you just stated, that if it was a, um, if it was a rally of, 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 of Black Lives Matter activists who are armed, even though it's rare, if ever, um, that you have a major rally of, of Black Lives Matter activists or that, that are armed. Um, and, you know, there would have been a massive police contingent and then people would have been scared. But then when you actually look at the casualty list, when you look at what group is, is most responsible for domestic terror, what group is more likely to be killing Americans? It's not so-called Black Lives Matter violent activists, you know, as they've been deemed by the by the FBI. They're actually not a threat <laughs> to American lives. They're not a national security problem, but certainly far white wing white males indeed are. And but people still aren't scared of them. <laughs> Even when they come tens of thousands of them armed, there isn't fear. And I think because there's this deep and abiding sort of connection between sort of blackness and danger and, and, and whiteness and peace, even when that whiteness is, is armed. Well, how do you look at, though, law enforcement? I forget if you've written about this uh, specifically, but it, it would seem that racism is endemic within our law enforcement uh, in this country, especially at the state and local level, and you could argue at the at the federal level as well. I mean, you, you're seeing more and more uh, of this coming out, and it's 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 pretty obvious. They're pretty open about it. Just the the idea of white supremacy within law enforcement, Ibram. I mean, it seems almost institutionalized. I don't want to generalize. We hate to generalize about anybody, but I mean, it's easier for me to generalize about a profession because you chose that as opposed to, you know, uh, characteristics that you didn't choose, gender, race, sexual orientation. So, I mean, I I think there was a study, a pretty massive study uh, done a few years back of basically police attitudes um, and, and viewpoints about race and racism. And I forget the exact percentage, but from what I remember, an overwhelming percentage of of white uh, police officers, and when I say overwhelming, 80, 90 percent of white um, police officers were, were surveyed as basically stating that there's no longer a race problem that racism basically doesn't exist, that we're in a post-racial society. And so what that means is that they believe that 40% of the incarcerated population in this country is black 
because black people are more violent, more criminal-like, and are committing more crimes. In other words, there's not racism within the criminal justice system that's leading to this mass incarceration of black bodies. They thereby believe that the reason why black people are far and away more likely to be shot and killed by the police is because there's something wrong with those people. And, and so fundamentally, that belief this belief that this nation is is post-racial is a white supremacist belief. And mm. so if the overwhelming majority of white police officers are, are harboring that belief, then then it seems to me that, it, that what you say is absolutely correct, that indeed, you know, white supremacist ideology is is prevailing in these police um, departments. It would, it would also seem to be the case in, in the U.S. military. We could get into that as well. Uh, and and we should. I mean, people should be looking into that as well. But let me ask you about the thing. The thing that is so kind of fascinating and obviously enraging and frustrating. And you've talked a lot about this. You talk a lot about this in your book and your lectures and and your work. Is that so often? And maybe I'm phrasing it wrong. This is the way I see it. That the most obviously racist people don't admit that they are racist they don't or, or and i always would say and and will say in conversation with them well wh- how do you define racism and often they'll point to uh someone like al sharpton as a racist or jesse jackson uh it will be their top two but my question to you is when someone is a clear white supremacist and, pro- and, and professes white supremacy and talks about. I mean, they're Klan members. I saw an interview once uh, in some documentary where this guy was referring to people of color as animals uh, and then said, but I'm not a racist. Help me understand why the most obviously racist people don't think that they are racists and don't have any seemingly understanding of what the idea means. Because that has essentially been the history of racism itself. I think most Americans would would many Americans would, would consider slave traders and, and enslavers and, and Jim Crow segregationists to be racist. But those groups commonly self-identified themselves as, as not racist. They commonly denied that their policies and their ideas, that there was something wrong with them. And they, con- they commonly considered slave traders, I should say slaveholders, commonly considered abolitionists the real troublemakers. Jim Crow segregationists commonly considered civil rights activists the the, the true troublemakers, the, the agitators. Um, and so, you know, they're just sort of walking in the history of racism itself. And so it's not surprising when we know that history, that denial is has essentially always been, been racism's heartbeat. How do you handle that? How, how do we change? How do we change that? How do we how do we define, as you have so well, uh, to the the actual racist, what racism is? Well, I think to give you to give an example of what you stated that, you know, you would ask a person, how do they define a racist? And they would point to an individual. That's not a definition. Um, and, and so I think we have to continue to press them to give an actual definition that we can put in a dictionary that can apply to all people. What people typically like to do is they evade defining racism, because when you evade defining it, then you can essentially attach it to anyone you want. That's not you. And so I think that's one of the things I'm trying to do with my work is is to essentially get us to to adopt these common definitions of, of racism that will then allow that will then prevent people from from being in so much denial do you think you've made um inroads on that effort that that we can because i feel like that's the one of the biggest problems in in the conversation in america about any divisive issue that we can't seem to uh, agree on the definition of a word much less a problem that i mean i i i think that i think I feel like um, in terms of the reaction to how to be an anti-racist, you know, many people have come to me and, and, and said that one of the, that they had been searching for clarity. And so you have people who actively and consciously don't want to define terms because they recognize that they would probably be implicated in those terms. Uh, and, and then you have other people who want to define terms. And, and I think, I think you have many Americans who do probably most Americans do. And, 
and and so I think for those people, um, you know, it's actually, from what I understand, it's really seeking, it's helping them because it's clarifying things for them and it's allowing them to essentially apply themselves and, and change themselves based on those clear terms, those clear definitions. Right. Uh, to end racism or, or to change things for the better, anything, we have to be able to teach our kids what the problems are. You have a, a daughter who must be, what, four now, Imani, your daughter? How do you yes. how do you teach your daughter? And you have the science that says that kids learn certain things at a certain age, certainly about race and gender and sexual orientation. Do you agree with what I'm saying that we have to strike at the root, which is childhood, to teach them about these issues? And if so, how do we do it? So I, I completely agree, and, and and that's why you know I'm actually have a have a board book for babies entitled "Anti Racist Baby" coming out in June. No and, way. And yeah, and, and Jason Reynolds um, and and I have adapted Stamp from the Beginning for middle schoolers and, oh, and high great. schoolers. That's great. That's um, great. In a book entitled "Stamped: Racism, Anti Racism, and You," which is coming out in March. Um, and so I think first we have to have the materials. Right. Um, but I think I think even more deeply than what parents are doing and utilizing these materials. And even one of the things I, I do with my daughter is I, you know, I bring her to events, even sometimes to my talks um, and and expose her. Um, and but but I think fundamentally we have to transform the American curriculum. Because, I mean, it's, you know, the, it's the job of the teacher. It's the job of the school. Um, it's the job of their learning environment to be providing them with this baseline that we then as parents can sort of support and enhance. And, and that's why, you know, I, I remember someone saying that the most politicized space uh, in this country is the classroom. Because, you know, this is a very serious um, issue. And, and so I think that that's where the fight, of course, for the minds of our children need to be had at the curricular level. And anyone who's serious about ensuring that we build a, a, a community of people in this country who recognize the equality of different racial groups will, will be involved in, in that fight. That's really exciting about that. You've got those, uh, those books, those projects uh, in the works. Um, I feel like there has to be a conversation about American media, and I'm really excited to see, like, for example, h how many inter – when I first saw your book was coming out, I tried to get in right right away with the, you know, the book uh, publicist and, and score an interview with you. Uh, but you were so busy and, and with, with the most high-profile media outlets, and that made me happy. I was like, well, that's great. Um, now you have created um, the Anti-Racist Center at American University, right? And yes. and and I and I saw that you recently um, have been hired as a, a CBS contributor. You're a columnist at The Atlantic magazine. My point that I'm trying to make is it would seem that the kind of mainstream corporate media is starting to understand the value of people who teach what you teach, write what you write and so on. I'm not sure that, that you know, politically we're there. And certainly there's a lot of, you know, uh, white supremacist media that is doing better than ever. And we can talk about that. But how do you think the media is doing it, trying to understand these issues that you've been writing about and teaching for years? So, I mean, I, obviously, I, I think that that there are sort of many sort of talented journalists um, and even editors and producers and, and, and leaders who are serious about these issues. And, you know, but the question is, you know, are they sort of pushing up against winds within their own organizations or, or are they being supported? And, and I think it's different in, in different sort of companies. But you know, I do. I am excited about this current moment because there are so many talented um, people working within the media who are serious. But, but again, you know, they 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 have to have that institutional support um, in order for them to be the most effective. And and you know, and 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 fundamentally, um, I think that's part of the larger fight we're engaged. In. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. But the other the other the flip side of that is with the kind of democratization of, of opportunity yes. with media, meaning it used to be that um, someone like you could only get, or me could only get a job and, and make money at some of these mainstream media outlets 
uh, from you know print to television to radio. But now uh, any white supremacist can launch his or her own channel um, or have a Facebook page and be very overt and open and have a huge, huge following and be able to organize where that used to be left to the fringes. So what do you say to the flip side, the rise of white supremacy, the mainstreaming and even acceptance of it? You know, people, uh, they're not wearing masks anymore, as you know. Well, I mean. I mean, obviously, that's the the flip side, uh, and and for me, I think sort of engaging in in anti racist intellectual work, I think provides for the ability for people to be protected, you know, against that type of white supremacist propaganda. But but I also, you know, you can't really just democratize the media for 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 some groups and not all groups. Right. I, I do think though that we should and we you know probably are continuing to have a larger discussion and really argument about free speech because i i do i do not consider um bigotry um that induces violence i don't think that that should be essentially covered um under the banner of free speech hmm. um and and i think that you know hopefully one day um and I also do not think that public officials, particularly powerful federal politicians, should have the ability to traffic in in, in, in bigotry that is known to be false. Um, but but again, I, I think that that is is a larger debate. I think that we need to have. But can you imagine if if politicians were not able to essentially um, manipulate people into voting for them uh, as a result of, of bigotry that they actually had to. Um, actually had to actually do their jobs. They actually had to push policy proposals. They actually had to um, be effective, um, you know, legislators. I mean, I think that could revolutionize or help to revolutionize our political environment. I don't know. I worry about the backlash to all of that. I see it all the time. Absolutists uh, that can't seem to understand the damage uh, of of anything they might be saying, and that's the the the, the least of it. You're talking about politicians. Um, before yeah. I let you go, I want to ask you. You know, you you write in 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 your book. You talk intimately about the fact that you were um, diagnosed with stage four cancer. That your mother and even your wife also uh, uh, dealt with this, and you use it as a metaphor for for racism and how it grows. I don't want to ask you about that. You've talked so much about that. I talked about it with you before, um, and I highly recommend people get the book and read about it. I, I, I want to ask you about something related to that and something more general, something I've been asking a lot of my guests because uh, of, of the fact that when I lost my great uh, corporate media job in October, I've, been, I've had a really difficult time overcoming the adversity. You have dealt with a lot of adversity in your life. I would imagine nothing was more difficult than your your cancer diagnosis. And I just wanted to ask your kind of personal uh, practice in terms of how you dealt with that, how you overcame that, how you beat it. I, I, I mean, I, I think that for me, it was first and foremost trying to sort of not beat myself up. In, in the sense of having all of that sort of why me uh, mm. or what's wrong with me uh, sort of um, conversation with myself and, and, you know, overcoming that and then moving towards basically very specific goals. Like this is the problem. This is the extreme problem. And this is what I need to essentially get myself out of this. These are the ways in which these are the things that I could do on a daily basis to sort of control some of these side effects. Um, these are some of the other things that I could do as I'm going through this adverse situation to, to potentially get my mind off of it, even for a moment. But ultimately, it just, it causes me to become that much more focused, um, you know, on the goal of, of overcoming it, razor focused. And, and I think in those adverse moments, that's the, those are the times in, in our life in which we have to be most focused mm. um, wh on who we are and who we want to be. Um, and because ultimately those are the times in our life that are going to define us. Well said, but I mean, and the other question about that is, you know, you, you for, for Stamp from the beginning, you won the National Book Award, which is a very prestigious uh, award, but you were the youngest person ever to win that. 
now how to be an anti-racist is a massive hit as well. Uh, you, you've your career seems to be on fire for lack of a more sophisticated phrase. And you seem to just be doing better and better and better. What is your relationship with ego? How have you not let that become? It see, you seem like such a soft spoken, humble person. Uh, are you a monster? Ibram, are you an <laughs> egotistical monster and no one can deal with you because you've done so well at such maybe in a young age? You, it seems like you've had so much success. How have you dealt with that? Well, it's, I, one of the things I try to do is, is be very clear um, about all of the different people um, and um, luck um, that um, were critical in, in everything that I've basically been able to do. And, and, and so, and because that's fundamentally the case. And I think maybe it helps because I'm an historian and, you know, I, I sort of understand the larger sort of picture of all of the different things that had to come together in order for something to, to sort of be. And, and so in a way that I think that helps me. And then fundamentally, I think also because I'm, you know, this work is a, a mission oriented work. Um, and, and so there are serious problems. There are serious people suffering and, 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 and there are serious people who, uh, there are people who, who are engaged in, in serious work trying to, to alleviate this suffering. And so this is part of a larger struggle. Um, and, and there's, I'm part of a larger community that's, that's part of that struggle. And, and to me, that's where my focus is not necessarily on, on, on myself and sort of who I am and anything like that. To me, that's, that's, that's irrelevant and that's debilitating to, to the larger struggle. Uh, last question. Is there anybody, and that was a great answer, by the way, really helpful. Uh, is there anybody that is running uh, for the Democratic nomination that you think understands best the concepts that you've been writing about and teaching about in terms of anti-racism? So I think in a, in a larger sense, Democrats have been debating first and foremost whether a progressive candidate or, or a moderate candidate would be best suited to, to defeat Trump. And then yeah. there's a, a, a side sort of discussion in terms of what would be the, just the best candidate um, to, to really help um, and advance, you know, American lives. I actually, not only do I think a progressive candidate obviously would, would, would be the best um, for America, even if there wasn't a Trump on the ballot, I actually think a progressive candidate has a better chance to beat Trump. You do. Um, and, and so, you know, to me, you know, I'm supporting, um, you know, the progressive candidates and, and there's obviously two major progressive candidates, uh, still currently, you know, in the race. And I'd be equally excited, um, if either of them were, were the nominee. Don't you, but you say you don't subscribe to the idea that the the progressive candidates, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, who you're talking about, obviously uh, scare away the, quote, moderate voter? Well, actually, um, I actually consider there to be two kinds of swing voters. And I actually recently wrote a piece with The Atlantic called The Other Swing Voter. And so the, the common idea of the swing voter is the voter who swings from Republican to Democrat. And those voters are almost totally white, but there, but there are also voters who swing from voting Democrat to not voting at all. In other words, they assess the candidate, the democratic candidate. And if they don't like that democratic candidate, or if they're subjected to voter suppression or even voter depression messaging from, from Russian trolls and others, right. um, they're less likely to sort of vote. And when you look at the 2016 election, there were two major groups that um, the Democrats lost. There, there, there were these white swing voters or these Obama to Trump voters and the Obama voters who didn't vote in the 2016 election. And those voters are predominantly and prototypically young and people of color, but especially young black um, voters. And, and so the progressive candidate has a better chance to win the other swing voter. And then when you look at the white swing voters, that's a huge group. In other words, they're not a monolith. Within white swing voters, you also have young voters who swung surprisingly for Trump, young white working class voters who sprung surprisingly to Trump, and very liberal 
white working class voters who who swung for Trump. Thirty eight percent of 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 white working class voters who wanted policies more liberal than Obama's voted for Trump. These are two prime sort of groups that progressives actually do better with young voters and, and very liberal voters. I will uh, link to that. I hadn't seen that article uh, at The Atlantic, the other swing voter, and I will let you go. It's been an honor again to be in conversation with you. I honor and value the work that you and the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center are doing at American University, and I hope that you will join me again. Dr. Ibram Kendi, uh, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work, and I'm excited for those kids' books, too. Got to talk about them. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, bye-bye. All right, Ibram, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today, man. I'll uh, post this up tomorrow and, and send you all the links, and Rachel as well. Hmm. He hung up very quickly. Didn't even hear that. Oh, well, we carry on. Now I got to move on to guest number three on today's podcast. I wanted to make sure I got this on the Wednesday episode so we could fo- uh, promote the Thursday night debate or Intelligence Squared Debates, where we talk to my friend John Donvan. You've got to go to IntelligenceSquaredUS.org. They have so many great debates and the motion tomorrow night in New York at the Florence Guildhall Theater is... It's time to expand nuclear power. He's got Bill Nye, the science guy, giving the keynote. And John Donvan and I talked a little bit, or a lot, I should say, about nuclear power, previewing that debate. Let's get right to guest number three, John Donvan, right now. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen, my friend, the brilliant John Donvan joining me. John, thank you very much. Excited to have you on the podcast. I, 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 I feel like I'm, I, I was going to say I'm a podcast virgin. I'm a Pete with a stand up with Pete podcast virgin. I, I'm really delighted that in your reincarnation, you're having me be part of the first month or two. So thank you. I'm uh, very, very excited to have you. And I want to do a much longer interview with you about all of uh, your career and your ideas. If you're ever uh, up for it, because John Donvan is one of the most thoughtful, interesting and intelligent people I've met. And uh, so I I hope to do something longer. And of course, I want to keep doing these previews of the Intelligence Squared debates. Uh, Before we get to the debate, which is uh, this Thursday, which I just talked about the dates and and, and everything where people can find it. uh, I did want to tell you, I was in Charleston, South Carolina doing a comedy show and there was a whole bunch of listeners there this past weekend. And it's always great uh, to, to, to meet people who listen to the show and so on. And it's always interesting to hear, you know, wh- what guests or what they liked about the show. And this one uh, woman came up to me and, and we were talking for a little while. And she said, you know, I have to tell you that John Donvan's book changed my life. And her wow. her son is an 18 year old who is, uh, I guess, I don't know if the word is moderately autistic, but he wasn't diagnosed until much later in life, I suppose. These days, uh, th- there it's easier to diagnose younger. But she said that your book, In a Different Key, The Story of Autism that you co-wrote, uh, changed her entire life. So I just wanted to rela- relay that to Holy you cow. on the record and get your reaction to how often you hear that kind of a thing. Um I've heard it a couple of times about the book, but it just it just it just grabs my heart. And and the reason is two two things. My co-author Karen Zucker, you've met Karen, and you know that she has a 25 year old son on the spectrum, who's um he's having his struggles in life. And it was Karen who who recruited me to be her professional partner in reporting about autism at ABC News, and then we ended up writing the book together. And Karen's motivation, and this is for everybody out there who has uh, a loved one on the spectrum, but more importantly, it's for everybody else. Karen's motive was to try to educate the larger community about autism so that so that they would recognize that all of us as a large society, we're the ocean that autistic people swim in and that they have a lot of struggles and that we can help, we can help them float and we can help, you know, by making them part of us, that we're all in it together. And so to hear somebody say that the book had that impact is just enormous. And the other thing is that it took a long time to write. I'd never written a book before. And there were nights that I would be up till two o'clock in the morning trying to get one paragraph finished and thinking, is anybody ever going to care about this thing? Oh, yeah. And so to hear that it <laughs> landed. Relate. Yeah. 
to hear that it landed with this woman and that it made an impact is just enormous. So thank you. For Absolutely. That. Uh, so also, uh, what's the? Can you give us any update on the documentary that you and Karen have uh, have been working really hard on? Yeah, um, we are. Uh, that goes with the book. We, we, yeah, so we've made it. We're, we've been working for two years on a documentary based on the book. It's uh, coming down the home stretch. I think we're going to have it completely edited within about three or four months. Um, we had a very exciting development. Um, Karen reached out to jazz legend Wynton Marsalis and said, "Would you by any chance be willing to do the music for our movie?" And we knew that. He has a brother with autism, and he saw us speak once at a conference. We hadn't met him, but he was in the audience, and he remembered us and he remembered her. And he said, like, immediately, he said, yes, I'll do it. And he um, he scored some songs, wrote some songs, some, some pieces for our film, and we've recorded them now. And it was an incredibly amazing, exciting day we spent with Wynton Marsalis, who is the nicest like superstar oh, yeah. you've ever met. He's hmm. he's he's got musicians in a studio recording this stuff, and he kept stopping and saying, "Is this working for you guys? Is this what you want? Does this fit the movie?" And um, he cared, and it was great. So those are a couple of exciting things. That's going awesome. On with the movie. That's fantastic. Yeah. I cannot wait to see that. And all right, let's get to the debate. Intelligence Squared US dot org. It's this Thursday in New York City at seven p.m. Uh, tickets available, so go to the website. And and John, uh, you know, before we again before we get to the debate, we're on a podcast right now, and the Intelligence Squared podcast I'm looking at is is very popular. Do you do you know anything about that? I mean, the ratings. There's a ton of ratings. It, it seems like a it's a very popular podcast, and the podcast is just basically a recording of your debates. So uh, everybody the should go is, listen. I, to, I, there's like I 184 of them uh, available. Y- yeah, I, I, well, that's a lot. That's amazing to me. Yeah, because um, they're very, very complicated things to put together, and we have a, a a very, very efficient, which is another way of saying lean, and high powered staff putting these together. And it's amazing that we're up to 184 debates. Um, I honestly don't know the podcast numbers. I do know that um, that when I go out in the world, I'm meeting people all the time who who actually tell me things like, oh, I work out to your podcast. And I'm thinking, I don't know how you like time the reps for for a debate, you know, a debate about, you know, bank policy or something like that, uh, <laughs> how that fits into a workout routine. But I, I really hear it all the time. And um, and it's across the spectrum, by which I mean demographically and age, you know, generation wise. So I know this podcast is getting, our podcast is getting out there and, and, and definitely touching well, people. And that's kind of an exciting Thing. Yeah, I mean, I have actually never told you this, and I, it, it, that only it only comes to mind now. Your voice makes me want to do cardio. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. There's a whole podcast in that. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's so many great episodes out there. But, you know, just in, in uh, November of last year, is parenting overrated? Uh, the next episode, is capitalism a blessing? And these are the, the names, the, the motions that are argued. Should we legalize assisted suicide? And the motion for the debate this week, it's about energy. It's about electricity. And the motion is, it's time to expand nuclear power. And it's a really very important issue, as are all the issues that you debate. But this is is most important now because of climate change and trying to solve the problem. And I just want to start this conversation by saying, or talking about this debate by saying, it seems that the... The scientific community, the renewable energy community, the environmentalist community is somewhat divided on on mm-hmm. on the future of, you know, th- we all admit that there's this problem, unlike a certain segment of the population, that, that climate change is a problem. Uh, but it, it seems to be pretty divided, those communities, on nuclear energy being a solution. And uh, a lot of opinions are changing. Am I? Do you think I'm right about that? Is that sound? Uh, that's absolutely, yeah. It's absolutely why we're doing the debate now. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, I, I wrote a... Um, an email to our uh, our fan base, our followers, about this debate in which I pointed out that the nuclear energy argument is kind of an old argument, but it's been renewed in a new way. And by an old argument, I mean, when I, when I started my career as a reporter, uh, the very first political demonstration I ever covered 
was an anti-nuclear demonstration, and it was an environmentalist demonstration. And um, it, the you know it was right it, three Mile Island accident in Pennsylvania had happened, one of the more notable and frightening episodes of a nuclear accident. Chernobyl came some years after that. I covered the Chernobyl uh, disaster oh, from did? Europe. Um, and then, um, of course, Fukushima happens in Japan. And, and the, in the, before climate change changed the d- dynamics of this argument, if you were an environmentalist, you were definitely against nuclear power. Now, it's gotten, as you said, much more interesting because the scientific community and also the environmentalist community has divided because nuclear power, for all of its challenges, does not emit carbon and the question is, and, and we we do know how to do it. The technology is there. It's been there for 50 years. It's always been controversial. But now the question is, if, if, if climate change is an emergency that must be dealt with right now, shouldn't we be using nuclear power in the meantime to get us across to the time before sustainables really take hold? So the debate this week, you have uh, some obvious, as always, uh, fascinating experts that are going to be for the motion, against the motion again. The motion is, it's time to expand nuclear power. Uh, and I don't know if this is unique, but it seems to be you have a keynote speaker, and that, of course, is one of the most famous people, much less scientists and educators in the country. Bill Nye, the science guy, is going to be given a, yeah. given a keynote. Why and what will he be doing? How will he be, what, setting it up? Uh, he's going to be setting up a little bit the topic, but more we're asking him to set up the mindset that we're hoping our audience will bring to the debate, which is we, we want to encourage the audience, as we always do, to listen to the arguments for their own sake, to listen, really listen to the to the case that each side is making before the audience makes up its mind. And the reason why we went to Bill Nye for this is that he, uh, Bill Nye used to be very, very skeptical of genetically modified food. And then he changed his position and he now says genetically modified food has a place in the world it's it's oh it's you know he's basically given it his blessing um and it's been very controversial because he was a staunch uh skeptic now he's a definitely a supporter he's done a 180 that's his term for it and the reason that he did that where his thinking began to change was at an intelligence squared debate where he was in the audience and he uh, the, res- the resolution literally was genetically modified food. He's in the audience, he listens to the arguments, and he changes his mind. And so, uh, listening to science. And so, we're doing a debate where we're encouraging the audience to listen to science. And he- we're going to bring him up and say, all right, so you listened to science and you changed your mind. How is that possible? You know, what what did you do? What should the audience be listening for? So, we're going to ask him to recount that experience of admitting that his position had to be revised. And um, we're also going to ask him to explain a little bit how nuclear power functions. Well, that'll be a, 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 it's a big name. He's always interesting. He's great to watch and speak and listen to. And so Bill Nye uh, kicks it off, and, and then you get into it with your, your, your debaters, the big debate. And there are kind of three things that I, I see, and, and you can tell me if I miss anything. But, of course, uh, one is, you know, we need electricity. There's 7 billion people on the planet. Is nuclear energy a good, efficient uh, form of electricity? The other, of course, is <clears throat> it being a solution here for climate change. And I guess I'm going to say four. The, the, the third one is the danger uh, that nuclear power, of course, presents to a community, a state, a region, an entire uh, planet. And you mentioned the three uh, disasters that we know or accidents that we know of. And, and those are always debated in terms of how much damage they did. Uh, but but the fourth one is what I want to start with, which is cost. I've always heard and read that the, the, the cost for building power plants is just too much. They take forever to build. They're never mm-hmm. on budget. This is probably the most boring, but the, all four of these uh, arguments are important. Um, is that going to be a part of this debate? It's, it's the least sexy yeah. part, but a very important part, the, car, the cost of building a nuclear power plant and how long they take to build. It's, yeah, absolutely. Because the the team that's going to be arguing against nuclear power is going to go straight to the cost issue. Uh, and as you say, the nuclear power industry has a long, long 
pattern of taking way too long, at way over cost, and that's also requiring government subsidies to uh, to get the job done. But then there's also just the practical argument: if they take if they take so long to build, and we're talking about facing, you know, a, a do or die climate change a, a solution in the within the next ten years, they, they we're going to hear the argument that nuclear power st- we would need thousands of nuclear power stations is going to be the projection. There are about 450 in the world now. We're going to need many, many more if we're going to make them a part of the uh, solution for climate change. The argument we're going to hear, and I think we'll hear a counter argument as well, is that it's it, we can't build them in time. It, we can't build them in that time frame for when we would need them. So I think absolutely the point you're making is going to come up. Well, the other one, and I, I guess I haven't, I didn't read about this in, pre- in, in preparation to talk to you, and I read all the articles that you present at intelligencesquaredus.org for folks to to get educated. But what I didn't see and what I don't hear a lot about, and I don't know why, is the NIMBY argument. Like, <laughs> who wants a nuclear power plant in their backyard, in their state, in their region? Because, of course, the danger of, of an accident, of, of a meltdown. I mean, the, the politics of, oh, we're going to build a nuclear power plant. Well, there goes the neighborhood. How come I feel like we don't hear that that much? Did that come up in your prep? Uh, it hasn't, but I think it will in the debate, and I think it will this way. The the reason there are not more nuclear power plants in the United States right now is for that very reason. Um, there's been, as I said at the beginning, there's been my first political demonstration ever that I covered as a reporter was an anti-nuclear demonstration, and communities around the country have fought these things and fought them uh, because they don't want them within 50 miles of, of their homes. And uh, and that's that led to re- a regulatory process that from the point of view of the companies trying to develop these things is very, very tangled. Um, and so I, I do think that uh, nobody really wants to live near one unless, you know, you're Homer Simpson, then it doesn't seem to matter to you too much. But <laughs> yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that the where, where do we put them? And also, the other question is, where do we put the waste? And um, that's another big challenge. Yeah, that's a huge challenge, although it seems like uh, they're figuring out some solutions for that. Uh, all right. So the, the I have to ask you, I didn't realize that you'd cover the Chernobyl accident, I guess, probably for ABC uh, News. CNN, actually. Oh, really? So what what was that? What can you tell me about that? Well, I, I, you, you know, I don't I, do that. I was scared and I'm going to sound ridiculous now. But by I wasn't scared, scared, like terrified, frozen, but I was very concerned Um I was I was in my early 30s and I had not had children yet but what had happened was um I was based in London at the time and word began to trickle out from as I recall Sweden initially that there was a there was a leak somewhere and the Soviets were denying and the Soviets were denying and, and then I think the CIA weighed in and uh, the the news that there had been a leak did not come from the Soviets. It came from from other parties, and so there was great uncertainty about what was going on. And Geiger counters began picking up readings like all over Europe of higher levels than were expected. And I was based in London, and I was told they wanted CNN wanted to put somebody in every country that was potentially in the downwind from the cloud that was moving westward and northwestward across Europe. So I was sent to Geneva. Go to Geneva and f- if the you know be there if the cloud comes and and find out what people are doing now. So it was a sort of a it 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 kind of, there's a little bit of a lesson about what the danger is like is I'm I'm in Geneva doing a stand up in their amusement park there. Uh, I'm sorry, not Geneva. Uh, uh, I went to Vienna, doing a stand-up in their amusement park there, and because uh, Vienna was that much closer to uh, to the Soviet Union, and um, and I'm thinking I have no idea if that cloud is here now and if I'm being zapped right now, and it was a weird feeling. So in in retrospect, it seems crazy. Oh, you went to uh, you went to Austria and you stood in an amusement park. Big deal. And I, I would, I would agree with that. So it sounds silly now, but at the time, not knowing where it was, not being able to see it or smell it, not knowing what damage it would do, not knowing how widespread it was, not knowing if it was taking, you know, hit, d- devastating Ukraine and and then Poland and then Germany and then Austria, and if it kept moving and kept moving, how big it was going to be was a really, really scary thing. I can only imagine. I mean, it's like uh, drawing straws. The correspondence for that one. 
uh, in terms of who's going to cover it and where you're going to be and not knowing all of the uncertainty is had to have been terrifying. But I guess you're all right. I mean, that's the question. It seems to have worked out. Yeah, I mean, I know. I now, I, in retrospect, I learned that the radiation levels were, were fine right. where I was. And a really interesting thing is that that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Um, that that was such a turning point in history because Gorbachev, who was running the Soviet Union at that time, used Chernobyl as a uh, justification for purging the leadership and opening up the Soviet Union to more, some degree of more kind of normal, more, I don't want to say liberal behavior, but uh, glasnost, that glasnost, glasnost. And perestroika period. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That all that all was a result, that was all motivated by Chernobyl. Oh, and, wow. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can look at Japan and, and see the, uh, the, the consequences of that in terms of policy and politics as well. But that's the other thing that will be debated, I imagine, at the Intel Squared debate uh, this week, which is going to be debating this motion. It's time to expand nuclear power, which is fascinating to hear that in all of the accidents, the three major ones that we hear about, I guess they're the only ones, right? Chernobyl, uh, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima – how many actual deaths there were, and there were apparently very few, but it depends so on far. How, it, it, hmm. exactly it depends on how you categorize them. I, I think of the Vietnam War when you know guys died in combat, and so those are obviously uh, KIA. But then there's a whole generation of, of, of people that are suffering from Agent Orange, or you could talk about 9-11, those who died on 9-11, and then the, the health consequences later, or any number of these types of issues. How do you categorize death or illness or cancer related? It, it, it's hard to, to hard. prove, I yeah. suppose. So how is that going to be? I mean, will that be debated? And, and yes. how do you think yeah. they look yeah, at that? I, th I, th I, think, um, I think we're going to hear from the debaters that some, from one side that, um, look, let, let's count up how many people were actually hurt at, after Fukushima. And um, and come in with um, numbers that I think that they will feel bolster their case, and the opponents will say, "Well, let's wait a little bit longer." Um, and I, I do know that one of the arguments we're going to hear is that panic about nuclear power is more dangerous than nuclear power itself is. What does that mean? The the, the panic is more dangerous in that in the moment, or oh it, it, yeah, I think it means it causes first of all psychological fear causes psychological problems, but also the panic leads to kind of a political process in which nuclear power. I think for the, the argument is going to be nuclear power gets an undeserved bad reputation uh, that 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 limits the ability to expand nuclear power. So it's a little bit self serving argument, but I can see how the case can be made. And and the other one that I think is the most kind of uh, consequential or scary or sad uh, outcome is if there is a any kind of accident, any kind of meltdown, that the ecosystem there, that the air and, and the land and the sea is is uh, uninhabitable for generations. But how true is that? I mean, where... I think that's pretty... I, I guess it, it's going to depend on how it's contained and when it's contained. But I, I was thinking about this. If, if nuclear power had existed... Um, during you know the reign of Henry the Eighth, if we go back 450 years or so, and and they had an accident and they stored the stuff somewhere, you know, out by the, uh, you know, out out, out in the uh, what am I thinking of the, the, the circle? Sorry, the moat. Yeah, yeah, it's well, in the moat. I was thinking I was thinking Stonehenge. What if they had buried it near Stonehenge? <laughs> 450 years later, we still couldn't be able to go there. Right. Um, right. So um, that part, you're right. It's where everybody knows that the, the waste needs to go somewhere for hundreds of years. And so if we're if the human race is still around here hundreds of years from now, we're we're leaving a legacy that they will have to be aware of and deal with. And maybe it's going to be fine and be contained. I don't know. But it's a, it's a kind of scary thought about how... F how big a commitment to the future we make when we uh, when we use nuclear power? Okay, so what else are we missing in terms of what what you're obviously as, as well as always as prepared question, for this yeah. debate as you are for all these debates? You become the expert in your preparation for these things because you're such a, an intelligent, well studied guy. So, what what are some of the other issues that you'll be bringing up in this debate that are going to be obviously pretty controversial? I'm still in my preparation phase, so I don't know all the answers to that, but I do know that we're also going to look at, what, at the question of whether renewable sources can fill the gap. And, right. and, and so the, the basic argument for we have to expand nuclear power is going to be – and by the way, all four, all four uh, panelists on both sides uh, are 
are concerned about climate change and want to do something about it and consider it an emergency. The question is, how do we deal with it? So the side that's arguing for nuclear power uh, is is certainly pro sustainables. They're not supporters of the nuclear power industry, and you know that's not their point. They ju- their point is n- renewables can't do it in time. It's just not going to happen. It, there's 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 not it, the it's not so much a cost question as a capacity question and a technology question and a speed question. That's going to be their argument. I mean, I I, I think we're going to hear pushback on that. But that's the whole argument for nuclear power is going to be a little bit of an argument about the readiness of sustainables like wind and solar. And then, of course, the other thing uh, is the uh, intermittence, meaning wind's not always blowing, sun's not always shining. And and the argument is that nuclear power or some other energy electricity source will make up the gap uh, because it's more consistent, I guess. Right. And so the question is, what about you know, the solution to that is going to be batteries, battery technology. Sure. Yeah. So if, you know, battery technology is not there yet, could it get there fast? I mean, there, it, it is clear that renewables are moving faster than even the more optimistic projections. And the cost has come down hugely in a short period of time. So I, I, I think we're going to hear um, a very optimistic argument for renewals, renewables as part of the argument against expanding nuclear power. And then I think we're going to hear the counter argument from the other side. You have had so many debates. Uh, you have moderated so many debates at Intelligence Squared. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, I remember being at the capital punishment, the, the death penalty. We could talk about mm-hmm. guns and, and uh, women's reproductive rights or any economic debate, uh, religious debates. Some of these debates are obviously really, really uh, controversial. There's a lot of passion. There's there can be anger and so on. I some I, for some reason I feel like we're not going to have that on Thursday night. But what do you think in terms of the mood and the passion of the debaters and of the oh, audience? Yeah. I, I disagree new- with you about that. How dare and, you? And, and, and yeah, one reason is um, these 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 four debaters kind of know each other, and they've I think these, there's a little bit of a little bit of. Uh, history among some of them, mm-hmm. and they don't disrespect each other, but they've disagreed before. But one of them, uh, Gregory Jaco, is arguing against the expansion of nuclear power. His job during the Obama administration was as chairman of the U.S. Uh, nuclear Regulatory Commission, which meant he was in charge of nuclear power policy in the U.S. So he's he's like completely switched sides from the position. He was always skeptical. He was always, you know, urging caution. He was he was, you know, he was not somebody that the industry loved, but he had his hand on the levers of nuclear policy. And he's now out there on our stage arguing against it. And um, he's he's I'm, I'm sure his conversion story is if if it should be explained as a conversion, I don't think it's a hundred eighty, but I think the story of his evolution, I think he's going to probably bring into the argument, and that makes it personal and that makes it passionate. I think. Well, it's going to be a, a great debate. It's such an important issue, as are all the issues that are debated at Intelligence Squared. You can listen to the podcast after it's over, but we'd love for you to go and, and get tickets. I'm going to try to make it there myself. It's in New York City. The motion, it's time to expand nuclear power. Always a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm very excited that uh, I, I'm gonna, we're going to keep previewing these debates right here on the podcast the way we did at SiriusXM because I think that Intelligence Squared is such a great source of information for people. You guys do a great job at picking the debates, selecting and defining the motion, and obviously booking the guests. And look, you got Bill Nye there, for goodness sake. Uh, John Donvan, one of the greatest, one Thank of the uh, most important journalists of our generation and the best moderator of all debates. I only hope... Uh, they can come to their senses and and, uh, and book you to debate a, a, a presidential <laughs> debate if there are any. Yeah, I mean there might I don't not see be any happening. <laughs> but thank you, uh, John. Thank you very much. Follow him on Twitter. Go to intelligencesquaredus.org and listen to everything that they have on their podcast as well. John Donvan, thank you as always, my friend. Thank you, Pete. All right, check it out. Intelligencesquaredus.org. Listen to all of their. Previous podcasts, go get the rather debates, then go get the podcast and check it out and follow John on Twitter at John Donvan. Get his book in a different key for yourself. Anybody you know who has had autism touch their touch their life, get that book. Very, very good. 
Now joining us at the end of a wide-ranging discussion with three separate guests, a final guest, a fourth guest, Valerie Vendrami, my wife, joining me now to talk about our children's generation and their addiction to their phones. Uh, Zombie teenagers is what we're calling them, right, my love? No, Generation Zombie. Generation Zombie. What? Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm renaming them. Okay. And here I am again in the hot seat. Yes, you're yeah. in the hot seat. Mm-hmm. Everybody loved you. Getting used to this. You're good. Everybody loves to hear from you. They want to hear from you. Everybody loves your insight. So I, I wouldn't take it that far. That's I, I'll take it as far as I want. Well, I'll you know, you. Tell me where to take it. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm easy. I'm upstairs, so I guess. You're not easy. An, easy, an easy guest. Well, I appreciate it. We have three guests today. It's not an easy yeah, guest. It's not saying. fluff. This is because you are smart and you have a lot of insight and people like to hear from well, you. Well, I don't know much about this new generation. So. Okay, so what has what's the catalyst for today's appearance? Uh, you are fired up about, you had some kids in the car, some thirteen a bunch of 13-year-old girls. 12, and yes, mostly 12-year-old girls. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and, and what happened? Well, you were really fired up. Yeah, I was really fired up because I had four girls in the car and every single one of them were looking down on their phone, which, you know, is not unusual. It's what happens nowadays. You get these kids together and they're in a room and they're just looking at their screens. What's wrong with that? Um, but what was unusual this time, which really set me off, is that I'm ta- as I'm talking to one of them, she just does not even look up. Doesn't even look up as I'm talking. Still on her phone, doing whatever she's doing and just answering my questions. Mm-hmm. And this isn't a girl that I typically have in my car. She's not a really great, f- good friend of, of Julia, but What's she, her full name? she, um, so happened to be, so I'm not like extremely comfortable with her because if it was any of her other friends, I would have said, okay, let's put the phones away and mm-hmm. look at me and let's have a conversation. But, um, I really didn't feel like I could do that with this little girl, but it really set me off every time I turned around and I looked at her, she's just kept looking at her phone and I just thought, you know what? This is the end of humanity. It's it. It's over. <laughs> it's over. It's these phones. They're killing. The next generation is not going to happen because these guys, cannot look up from their phone enough to have sex. I mean, honestly, it's just crazy to me. Crazy. Well, (laughs) they're just so ridiculously addicted. And, you know, I don't even know how... I don't even know what to do. I mean... Well, hold on. Let me me play devil's advocate here. Let me try to get you fired up. Because what is the... What, why? Maybe you're just being, we're just old fuddy-duddies. No, and we're I mean, like I, any other generation looking at the younger generation. Ah, look at them with their video games and their mm-hmm, television sets. Yeah, and mm-hmm. they're, they're ter- I'm, uh, that, that could very well be. And the, they could be turn out to be this amazing you know, group of kids who change the world and save the planet. And I could be completely off base. But what I am seeing right now is kids that cannot have conversations with each other because when they're in the room together they're on their phone and they have a hard time having conversations with with adults especially and they're just like I don't know when, when I don't know I could just I could I you know I could list a laundry list of things that that potentially could and you know there's so much data on this now and there's so many things that they have uh, they have you know, evidence on depression, increased anxiety, increased suicide, and they're all correlating it to the phones and the screen time and, you know, the, the lack of being outdoors and the lack of having to socialize and, and being creative yeah. and, cr- and creating games and activities and just, you know, forcing when you when you're bored, the world opens up to you and they're just not bored ever. So I just cannot see this as a positive. I, I it's to me it's definitely more negative than, than a positive. And and our own children? Oh yeah, it's it's a huge problem. They're they're they've changed. They've changed dramatically since since the introduction of the the screens, without a doubt, and it's a constant, constant struggle. And and we've now implemented thanks to the Jewish culture because you know <laughs> yeah. now that I'm we have Shabbat now. Yeah, we have Shabbat. I'm 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 heavily in the Jewish culture now that I'm I work um, 
with a lot of Jewish people. And of course, I have many of, of which are very religious. They're and they, extremely religious. They follow the rules and they, mm-hmm. they uh, yes. Shabbat on Friday yes. night sundown. Yes. And I, I completely Until- appreciate that. That uh, that custom and and disconnecting from technology. Well, disconnecting from everything and having a we a a, a twenty four hours of just being present and you know connecting with your family, with your friends, without having any distractions whatsoever. That includes. Anything, not just the screen, just anything, no work, no, you know, any, no strenuous activities. They, they have it. They, they got that. So we have employed that by so, creating it once a month. What do you call it? Well, a cleanse. Well, we started it. Yeah. I say we should do it weekly. I say detox. It's called a detox. Once we did it on Christmas day. Cause I said, let's, let's experiment and do it on Christmas day. Then we and then after we said let's uh, let's put in one day a month in the calendar. I mm-hmm. I did say once a week, but that was you know met with some serious protest. But by the union, I would love. I think it would be so great if we can get the entire community to come on board. How do we do that? Because let me tell you, when I talk to their friends, yeah. parents, yeah. I have to literally. I talk to the 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 sort of recent detox day just came up on the heels of Ava's birthday, which is today actually. Um, I had to reach out to parents because they had some hangouts scheduled for that day. And I had to tell them, you know, the girls don't have their phones and, you know, if we need to get in touch with them, let's do it the old school way and get in touch with me. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and, oh, and there's a telephone, a home phone they could actually use. So here's the phone number they can call the home phone. So the parents are really, really... Uh, like loving this. When you wait, so, you, I don't I didn't know. Tell me this. You yeah. told you basically told other parents that our kids are unreachable because they're on their their phone detox, detox. Mm-hmm. and and their reaction was what? They loved it. They're like, that's a great idea. Really? Yes. So so I, I think, so, the, so it seems like other parents aren't really doing this, implementing this. I mean, I obviously so. in our mm-hmm. in our little no circle here, I'm sure people listening. Yeah, and and us. we've gotten stricter with the phone rules, and we've we've put uh, limits on their phones, which was way too late. We should have done this from the get go. Yeah. We just started this. So if your kids don't have phones yet, then we can talk to you about <laughs> when they'll get them and how they'll turn into zombies. And if they do have them, my question to folks listening is: What is the what are the rules that you have? How are you implementing them? Are you like us celebrating our own secular Shabbat? Yeah, uh, I detox, think I think we all cleanse. I think as parents, because we're completely experimenting right now. This is yeah. all experimental. We have no idea what the hell we're doing. Great point. But I think and we have no idea what's going to happen. There's no long term studies on any of this. It's all short term. It doesn't look good in the short term. <laughs> uh, but but what I do think we could all do yeah. together collectively is place limits on their phone and don't let them have their phone at night. It's hard. to and get, It's hard to, to do something, anything collectively. It's hard to get. I, I know, parents. but I think we have but to these just, kids, these this kids. has to be, this has to be I, the mission. I want to, I, I really want to start a whole new, like, society. You know, I know. I just want, I want to start a movement. I want to start All a right. like phones down movement. Phones down. <laughs> I love it. Phones you just did it. down I want to call the other parents and say, <laughs> your kid is calling my kid at 11 o'clock on a school night. Do you know that? That's yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And even later than that. But that's not appropriate. Even like, later. You can never contact well, because the other they're, n- they're allowed to be. They allowed to have their phones. Well, don't allow. Well, that. Then well, that's the movement I'm initiating. Phones down. Phones down. I think we have to have a limit. Every Hashtag night. phones down. Put your phone away, and that's it. Who's let's, in? Let's all do this together phones and down, save everybody. save humanity. We must save humanity. We have to. Phones that's, down. That's our mission. Who's in? Let's do this. That's Vivi Yoga on Twitter and Ad Val on Facebook and talk to her there. What else? That was my rant. I loved it. It was a good rant. You're right. I'll follow you anywhere, baby. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that is it. Thank you to Ellie Mistal, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, of course, John Donvan, and lastly, and certainly not leastly, my wife, Valerie Vendrami. Look them all up, follow them, buy their stuff. Everything is in the show notes. Subscribe to this podcast, give it a rating, and of course, 
consider a paid subscription on Patreon, where very soon there's going to be some very fun, bonus, exclusive content, which I want to help you suggest, have your help to suggest and create. Looking forward to it. That's all we've got for today. We'll talk to you Friday here on Stand Up. Tell your friends.